Next presentation is given by Dilap Kishore, talking about co-occurrence networks. Yes, uh, thank you for that. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Dilip Kishore, and I'll be talking about uh, inferring microbial co-occurrence networks from 16S data. So, so in the past decade, there have been uh, an exponential growth in microbiome data uh, from publications as well as public databases. Uh, and with this growth in experimental data, uh, with this growth uh, in data, there's both uh, evidence of experimental uh, uh, assays describing microbial interactions as well as uh, uh, associations that are derived from uh, micro microbiome sequencing data that also describe microbial interactions. But uh, so far, there hasn't been any effort to consolidate uh, all, all, all of these interactions into into a database so that comparative analyses can be performed. So that's where we've developed a MIND. Uh, we call it the Microbial Interaction Network Database. So uh, it's a database where we plan to consolidate uh, microbial interactions based on experimental evidence, uh, interactions derived from sequencing data as well as interactions predicted from computational uh, methods. And then we build a web interface on top of that that helps people uh, visualize as well as query these uh, interactions present in the database. Um, so this is a screenshot of the web UI. So it, uh, it helps you visualize these interactions as networks and compare, uh, compare interactions both within as well as across networks. I won't be going into much detail during, about the database during this talk, but if you're interested, you can come by the poster later. Um, so one of the main kinds of uh, data I'll be talking about during this talk is uh, metagenomic data, specifically uh, 16S uh, sequencing data. So through 16S sequencing data, you can obtain uh, these abundance tables, which are represented as a, which are represented here as a heat map, which basically tell you how much of what is present in which sample. So from this, you can generate what are known as co-occurrence networks based on which two microbes occur together. For example, here, uh, since uh, presence is blue and uh, presence is one and blue, uh, you can see that M1, um, yeah, so M4 and M3 co-occur together, uh, and M2 and M3 do not uh, have a negative association. So, um, yeah, so what you can see on the right here is a simplified representation of the 16S pipeline, and the way we want to try to look at it is in terms of these four steps uh, of the first one being denoising or clustering, wherein you take in uh, sequencing data and obtain ESVs or OTUs or whatever whatever you get based on whichever method you use there. Um, then the next step is taxonomy assignment where you assign uh, taxonomy labels to these uh, groups. Um, and then OTU processing where you uh, remove uh, copy number, uh, remove OTUs based on copy number uh, changes or uh, filter based on abundance. And then finally you get, uh, then you come to the network inference step where you infer uh, networks based on this abundance table over here. So, but there are uh, a few issues during the 16S analysis workflow uh, which contribute to a, a, a few errors downstream. So. The main one being compositional nature, uh, sequencing errors during uh, the sequencing, chimeras, copy number variations, and variable accuracy based on which part of the 16S you, you're sequencing. Uh, so as a result of these issues, there are um, a variety of tools that perform a particular step that I outlined in the previous section. And But all of these, but these tools are not uh, are not in agreement with each other, as you can see here. Uh, this is, uh, these are networks inferred from the same data set, but using different methods, and they look different. I'll, but um, some of these do try to infer different things, but um, this is just the network inference step. If you look at each step, the, it contributes a lot to the dissimilarity at the end. 
So our goal uh, for the database is to standardize uh, uh, the tools that give you the best co-occurrence network, you might say, and yes, to help optimize these tools and parameters for accurate networks. But uh, we also know that there is no one best tool that performs, uh, for, uh, performs the best for every uh, type of data set you might have. So we also have we built a set of tools to visualize as well as do comparative analysis uh, of these different tools uh, before your data set uh, in particular. So that's where this comes in. So we have built MindPipe, which is a 16S data processing package in, in Python. Um, so it processes, it, so the uniqueness of this package is, is that it lets you process data using combinations of uh, the tools that are usually so, uh, used as alternatives for some of these steps, and also lets you visualize the differences when you use different tools for the same step and perform uh, comparative analysis. Um, you can get the pipeline here. Um, and so, okay, so for the next couple of slides, I'll just be talking to you about uh, each step of the pipeline and how a different choice of tool in that step contributes to the result in that, uh, in, in that particular step. So here, denoising, as I mentioned, taking uh, the raw sequences and getting ESVs or OTUs. Um, so here, uh, this heat map basically shows you a pairwise comparison of representative sequences. Uh, those are just uh, the OTUs or ESVs that you get at the end of this process. Um, um, and the comparison is based on an unweighted unifrac distance here. And you, you can clearly see this outlier here, uh, where dark blue shows that they're similar. So, um, we can see that of, of these five methods, open reference, Dada, closed reference, Diebler, and De Novo, uh, we see that Dada and Diebler are close together, which, uh, which you might expect because they're newer tools and they also perform De Novo. I mean, there have been comparisons between these tools and this is something that you would also expect uh, look from the results. Um, so, to get a better objective view of this, we also compare. So uh, we also compare the reference representative sequences you obtained at the end of the method to the input reference sequences in mock communities. So we have several mock communities which we use to do this comparison, and this is the average of the um, unifrac distance obtained. So here also you could see that Dada and Diebler perform relatively better compared to um, the other methods, but they're still pretty far off. Uh, if you do, a, if you come look at this number, this, this is pretty high. So it doesn't really try to, it doesn't, it's not very accurate in capturing the uh, original reference sequences, but we surprisingly close ref also does pretty well. Um, so the next step uh, is taxonomy assignment, where you assign taxonomy labels using the, to these uh, representative sequences using uh, the, uh, date, date, various databases. Um, so what you can see here is uh, on the left of each, so these are three different databases, Green Gene, Silva, and NCBI, and on the left for each of these figures is the original OTU distribution, which is the same for each, each of these. And on the right is the um, genus composition assigned uh, by the database. And you can clearly see that even the top uh, most abundant representative sequence is sometimes assigned to a different label um, in a different database. And there, there are many other such differences, as you can see here, uh, which clearly show that the different databases are not in agreement with each other. Um, so this you can see when you compare Silva and Green Genes, as, as you look up a higher order, you uh, get a decrease in uh, match, matches. And the choice of the, we've, we've seen that the choice of the database actually depends on uh, the kind of uh, data set you have. It, so it's based on the species composition uh, you have in the mock community. So some of these databases perform much better uh, for uh, certain mock communities. That's because certain mock communities have certain species which are 
uh, which get assigned really well in these databases. So if you look at the last step, that's network inference, getting, uh, building a network from these tax, uh, taxonomy table. Um, you can see that the network inference uh, in reality actually contributes to the most variance. This just gives you a qualitative picture of how the different networks look like when you use four, dif six different um, network inference methods in this case where the green, so all the black dots are the microbes and the green uh, edges represent positive associations and the red edges represent negative associations. To get a more quantitative picture of the same, uh, same um, figure, you can look at these two plots showing uh, the number of nodes that are in common between all the, uh, so we are just looking at the four, um, we're just looking at these, the top three and this one here uh, for, com for the comparison here. So you can see that a large number of nodes intersect, but a very few number of edges intersect, so the highlighted in red here. Um, so what we looked at so far was uh, the choice of database, uh, so sorry, the choice of a different tool affecting the next step of the pipeline, but if you look at the ch uh, choice of each tool affecting the final co-occurrence network itself, you can see, um, you can take a look at the PCA plot here, which shows you uh, all the different combinations of networks uh, decomposed uh, using a, a PCA plot. So each, uh, e the, each color here represents a different database and each uh, shape here is a different denoising method and size is a filtering method. So uh, each point is a network here with a different combination of that. So you can clearly see clustering based on uh, the database. So from, from that you can actually uh, look at how much of the total variance in your networks is actually contributed to uh, contributed by each step in your pipeline. So the choice of database actually contributes to 25% of the possi possible variance you might get in your network. So that means if you change your uh, database, you might have a uh, very variable uh, network compared to changing your filtering, which, is, which only contributes to 5%. So, and based on some of this and uh, other results which I hadn't had time to show you today, we've come up with several defaults uh, tools as well as parameters which, which I haven't shown you here, but it's on the poster. If, you, if you're interested, you can come take a look at that. So to conclude, uh, we built a database of microbial interactions and a pipeline to infer co-occurrence networks. Um, and you can find the web UI over here at this link and the pipeline here, and this is my poster number. And I would like to thank Jen Jun, who's, who's worked mostly, who, who, who did most of the work on the database, and Gabriel and Ahmed, who's, who have helped me build the pipeline. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> it is time for one quick question while the next speaker copies his presentation to the laptop. So it seems a mess, <laughs> the different tools leading to different networks. So you don't really seem to have a definition. Oh, of what yeah. The so I is. think I forgot to mention, but for the network inference step, we actually come up with a consensus method. OK. So uh, yeah, to my, build, my question yeah. really is, do you use Cytoscape for your web interface? Ah, uh, no, we don't. We you build, should. We build something using D3. You should use Cytoscape. It's made for networks. Yeah, I mean, we, we thought of using that, but uh, one, the Genjun already had something in D3, so I think we just built on top of that. Yeah. But thank you for the comment. Okay, thank yeah, you very thanks. much. Is this your presenter, actually? Yes.